Simon Birmingham, welcome to the program. Good morning, David. Good to be with you. So the diplomatic uh, freeze with China is now over. We heard Xi Jinping there citing the mature approach of the Albanese government. Is, uh, is that how you see it? Well, David, I welcome very much the fact that this meeting has occurred. I welcome it on a couple of scores. Uh, importantly, the previous governments under Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison had to make many necessary but difficult decisions on foreign investment, on protection of critical infrastructure, uh, in safeguarding our democracy, uh, in handling sensitive telecommunications decisions such as the role of Huawei. These were difficult decisions and uh, they were always going to cause difficulty in relation to our relationship and engagement with China. But the conduct of these meetings demonstrates that China's attempts in terms of diplomatic isolation of Australia, the attempted economic coercion through the unfair trade sanctions uh, have not uh, been yielded to. They have not seen any change in Australian policy and I welcome the fact uh, that the Labor government has maintained those policy settings of the coalition and has maintained a recognition that the strategic challenges of the environment we're in have not changed. But does it also help that the Prime Minister is not talking about the need to prepare for war, that it's inevitable we'd join a conflict over Taiwan, not constantly comparing this situation to the 1930s? Well, David, it's important that we maintain a consistency in policy uh, and a consistency where possible in language as well. But that language uh, has to be one that, uh, that reflects the reality of the challenging circumstances we face. But does uh, it this help government that the rhetoric dialed down, times... is, is my question. Well, this government will have difficult times to come, no doubt. Uh, there is an inevitability that the challenges the previous government faced will be repeated at different junctures mm. in the future. Uh, it's still early days for the Labor government. We'll see how they ha handle those challenges when issues in relation to the South China Sea come up. But does up. it help that the war talks dialed down? Well, David, I think it's, uh, it's important that we maintain a position in terms of our language and our approach to the region that seeks to be as engaging as possible with all partners in the region, as respectful as possible, but also firm in terms of Australia's national interest and, when necessary, calling out egregious breaches by others, uh, be that in relation to activities such as in the Ch South China Sea or human rights matters. And, uh, and I note that in that regard, since the election of the Albanese government, we've had uh, the UN report on the Xinjiang region released. Uh, they joined in the condemnation with other nations, but they haven't joined in action like other nations in terms of the use of Magnitsky-style sanctions. And as a coalition, we would offer bipartisan support for them to do that. Just on that, so that's interesting. You want the government to impose Magnitsky-style sanctions on officials in China? Uh, following the release of that UN report back in September, I wrote to Penny Wong offering bipartisan support in that regard. Uh, she had previously uh, criticised the previous government for not acting in concert with other nations. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, given those san new sanctions laws were passed late in the term of the previous government, uh, that we would give that bipartisan support if the new government chose to use those sanctions. All right. And I'll come to some other sanctions questions in a moment elsewhere, but that's interesting. Um, let me just ask you about Taiwan. Do you think Australia should be supporting Taiwan's entry to the CPTPP trade pact? I think we should judge it on its merits. Uh, Anthony Albanese's answer that he gave to a question the other day uh, was clearly wrong and erroneous. He sought to say that it wasn't wrong, but his claim that Taiwan could not join because it is not a nation uh, was wrong. Well, he didn't uh, say they could not join. He just noted the fact they are not recognised as a nation. Well, he seemed to use that as a justification for why they couldn't join or shouldn't be allowed to join, David. Uh, the reality is that Taiwan is a fully fledged member of the World Trade Organisation. Mm. So too is Hong Kong, with whom Australia has a free trade agreement. So any consideration of Taiwan joining the CPTPP should be on the basis of assessing how we maintain unity amongst the members of the TPP, but crucially whether Taiwan can live up to the high ambitions of the TPP, the merits of the argument there. It is an ambitious trade agreement. It has particular terms in relation to, for example, state-owned enterprises and how they operate, as well as the management of data flows, transfer and storage. These set a very high standard for a trade agreement uh, and they ought to be judged on that and working cooperatively with all members of the TPP as to whether if they can meet those standards, then they can join. Should Taiwan be recognised as a nation state? No, David, there's no change in relation to the bipartisanship of Australia's uh, position there, uh, recognising 
China's uh, position in relation to uh, One China, uh, but not expecting and wishing to see any change to the status quo uh, undertaken in any unilateral way. What about the position on strategic ambiguity, what we might do in the event of any conflict over Taiwan? What's your view on that? Uh, well, David, my view is that we should assess all of these matters uh, carefully as things unfold and develop, but we should be prepared for any eventuality. Uh, and so we'll be looking carefully and closely at the Defence Strategic Review uh, when it is released early next year, uh, how that can help to enhance Australia's preparedness for any and all eventualities in terms of the protection of our nation uh, and the security of our region. During the nine years of the coalition government, uh, there was no minister visiting, no minister, minister visited Taiwan. Um, your colleague, the Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie, uh, when he was on this program, said he'd consider visiting. Would you? Well, I did visit uh, many years ago now, uh, and there not were not as a minister, though. Not as a minister. There were some discussions around a possible visit just prior to COVID occurring. Obviously, COVID put paid to all visits, as it did to, uh, to meetings such as the summits we've seen occurring face to face for the last couple of years. Uh, but, uh, but I would certainly be open to seeing a minister visit, uh, and, uh, and that will be a matter for the now government to consider. So even though you guys didn't do it, you would like to see a Labor minister visit? Look, I would be open to, uh, to seeing that occur. Obviously, it's got to occur in the right and constructive way as, right. to, uh, as to who goes and when they go. Uh, the Australian economist Sean Turnell uh, is back home after 650 days behind bars in Myanmar. Was the Foreign Minister Penny Wong right, do you think, to directly engage with the military regime there to secure his release? Uh, it's been right to see a consistency of, uh, of effort uh, in relation to Professor Turnell, who we warmly welcome and are very relieved to see him back in Australia, but a consistency of effort right throughout uh, both the previous government and this government. Maurice Payne and Penny Wong both worked hard with regional counterparts mm. and others. Penny uh, Wong directly support. engaged the regime. Uh, Maurice Payne, as far as I'm aware, did not. Do you think it was the right call? Well, as long as Australia's position in relation to the other human rights abuses, the thousands of individuals who are uh, still detained in Myanmar remains consistent, as long as those views continue to be put very, very strongly, and as long as we look for how we can enhance pressure on the Myanmar regime to, uh, to better respect human rights uh, and to see a return to genuine democracy, not sham elections, as, uh, as many fear will occur next year. Uh, these are important considerations and the government has to be considerate, uh, consistent in all of its engagement there. Should Australia now impose sanctions on Myanmar? Well, Australia should be, uh, be looking for how we work with regional partners to increase pressure on Myanmar and sanctions should be on the table as part of that. So the Morrison government didn't impose sanctions on Myanmar, why not? Again, David, part of, uh, part of that consideration should be the fact that, uh, that we've seen late in the piece of the previous government, the passage of those new Magnitsky-style sanctions laws that do give further options to government as to how they target and how they direct sanctions, uh, but also uh, the timing in terms of an opportunity to work with regional partners where we've seen that, sadly, Myanmar having signed on to ASEAN's five-point plan, uh, which we put great store in uh, previously, but that has not seen uh, any progress, mm. uh, and so there need to be alternative actions pursued as a result of the failure. Okay, but of you that guys, process. you guys didn't do it in government. But again, you're saying Labor should at least consider it. Well, times uh, times have moved on there, David. As I said, in government, we were lending great support to working with the other ASEAN nations. Their five-point plan was an important attempt uh, of the region to try to get progress in Myanmar. Sadly, Myanmar thumbed its nose not only uh, at people in its own country, at the rest of the world, but also at its ASEAN partners. Uh, and so new further efforts are necessary given the failure of that process. Even though they've just uh, done what we've asked for and released Sean Turnell, you think we should be slapping sanctions on them because we of the uh, human rights abuses that are going on there? We cannot turn a blind eye to the thousands of other individuals who are detained okay. in Myanmar, to the abuses occurring across the country, to the oppression of minorities that are happening, to the suppression of democracy and to the fact that it would appear they are preparing to undertake a sham election next year uh, as an entree to try to get themselves back into the international acceptance. Well, international acceptance should not occur off the back of a sham election, should not occur when we see such extensive human rights abuses occurring. What about Iran? The coalition is also calling on the government to impose sanctions on Iran over its treatment of women. What sort of sanctions? 
We've targeted sanctions on le the leadership of Iran, uh, of the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, these are the types of measures that, uh, that many other nations have applied. Australia is a long way behind like-minded countries and comparable nations when it comes to action in relation to Iran. Uh, since the murder of Masa Amini, uh, we've seen many other lives lost, uh, but we've also seen enormous courage uh, from Iranian civilians coming out onto the streets in their thousands, making clear that, uh, that they are standing firm in support of the rights, particularly of women and girls. And there is a sense that this could be a moment of time in relation to Iran. We won't know that for sure until things unfold, but Australia should be leaning in uh, to support uh, those brave souls in Iran so to be, uh, and just to stand to be clear consistent on that, with other nations. Are, are you saying that, that Magnitsky-style approach for senior figures in Iran, um, or are you saying we should go a whole lot further and stop selling wheat and wool and meat to Iran? Many of the Iranian Australians that I've engaged with have asked not for, and they've expressly said they don't want sanctions that could hurt the Iranian people uh, in terms of those economic sanctions. Right. But they do believe that there are many cases for targeted individual sanctions to be applied, as we've done in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and both the previous coalition government and the Labor government uh, have put in place further sanctions there. Uh, it's only fit and proper that we should act in terms of support for the movement that's occurring in Iran. That looks like it could, as I say, be a moment in time and therefore uh, Australia shouldn't be way behind like-minded mm. countries. We should be working and acting in concert with them. Let me turn to uh, some domestic issues. The resumption of Parliament uh, tomorrow and your role as um, the opposition leader in the Senate. Uh, just a few things. Will you support the bill to establish a national anti-corruption commission? We're waiting for the parliamentary committee processes to conclude and to see uh, precisely what type of amendments come through those. Uh, I hope and trust that, uh, that they will have considered the evidence from the Law Council of Australia, the Bar Association here in my home state of South Australia and others that have argued around ways in which the Anti-Corruption Commission can be improved in terms of the model presented uh, and that with those types of amendments that hopefully we can offer bipartisan support for its passage. The um, industrial relations reforms you're not supporting, um, if not, what do you think should be done to get wages moving or are you satisfied with where wages are at? David, uh, the importance of getting wages moving is one that we share, but this is not a bill that will get wages moving, it's so a what bill would... that will get unemployment uh, moving. Uh, it's a bill also that is not consistent with the policies the Labor Party took to the last election. So we have a Labor government that didn't tell Australians in advance of these policies, certainly didn't tell Australian small businesses, the tens if not hundreds of thousands of small businesses who will be adversely affected uh, by these policies that they are going to bring them in, and okay, are now so seeking how would you to get rush them going? through the Parliament. We've been very clear all along that you have to maintain economic strength uh, to get wages moving. What does that mean? Uh, this is uh, an economy growing as strongly as possible, keeping unemployment as low as possible. Uh, those are the things that our government managed to achieve with strong economic growth in our last year in office, with unemployment down to 50-year lows, creating the conditions for economic growth not to much wage help growth, to drive, not much to wage to drive growth, productive that, that, that wages the, growth. That was the problem though, you guys didn't achieve much wage growth. Well, this unfortunately from the Labor Party is a bill that is going to only put pressure uh, on businesses, mm. only create an environment for more strike action, for lower productivity and for job losses. Okay. Uh, they're not things that are going to provide for sustainable wages growth into the future, even if it essentially is legislation that pushes wages in some sectors, uh, it's also going to push unemployment up in many sectors. On energy prices, uh, can you just clarify, are you opposed to any higher taxes on the windfall profits of gas companies? Uh, David, uh, we don't think that, uh, that simply slugging a tax uh, in relation to, uh, to companies is going to do anything for the energy prices of Australians. You've got to fix supply in the gas market to provide uh, for genuine outcomes there and those types of taxes will actually only hurt you in the longer term because they'll act as an investment disincentive and mean you've got less supply for the future. But if it's a tax on the windfall profit, that, could then, that revenue could then be used to do something about the prices, presumably. And if you go down that sort of path, as I said, you will also create a disincentive for investment 
which means you'll only exacerbate and continue the supply problem into the future. So it would be a counterproductive measure in terms of tackling so the just root let them, cause let them of pocket the, the windfall. There. Let them pocket the windfall profits from these resources. David, let the government come up with a policy that's actually going well, you, to no, work. You, you've just said so, you're opposed to any tax, right? So, so, David, I've been clear that I think it would be a counterproductive measure because it would actually hurt supply in the future. Uh, so this government uh, had mm. five, six months uh, leading up to their budget. Uh, they didn't do anything in the budget. Uh, they've now had close to a month since the budget. They haven't managed right. to come up with a policy uh, since the budget either. There's clearly enormous internal division in the government as some and many, it seems, would agree with the type of proposition I've put that some of these floated measures around uh, okay. taxes or price caps or the like will only act as a disincentive to investment and in doing so mean you prolong supply challenges. The government should reverse okay. some of their budget decisions that actually will make it harder to bring more supply into the marketplace uh, and they should be working more constructively with industry rather than the type of excessive rhetoric we've seen from some ministers uh, that seems to suggest they want to be just at finally, war with industry. Just finally, on the voice to parliament, uh, you're the leading moderate in the Liberal Party now. Do you support uh, an Indigenous voice being enshrined in the Constitution? David, I strongly support recognition uh, and have done for, uh, for many years. And, uh, and of course, uh, the debate around the voice has come along subsequent to early efforts to try to achieve Indigenous recognition. When it comes to the model for the voice, uh, I do think Australians deserve to see more detail and have more answers about how it will work, how it will be constituted and how it will make a difference. I understand the very passionate views by those who argue for the voice mm. and I don't wish to see them disrespected in any way, but I also acknowledge that there are strong Indigenous views uh, of doubt and question about whether the voice will be uh, actually effective in achieving any substantial change on the ground in relation so to... You so you seriously haven't made up your mind after all the debate on this? Uh, David, uh, we're going to be asked to support a constitutional change yep. uh, for a model that is as yet undefined by the government in relation to that model. It's not unreasonable to want to see the detail of the model. All right. Simon Birmingham, thanks very much for your time this morning. Thank you. My pleasure.